let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Acts 27. Reading through the book of Acts lately, just finished it, started chapter one actually this morning again. Uh, I think Acts is a book you read every month, really. It, uh, it's, so, it, it's so chock full of uh, what the church is all about and how God uses people. But, you know, chapter 27, it's, uh, it's 44 verses, and it's all about Paul's voyage and shipwreck. And maybe you scratch your head and you think, well, Luke, who is the human writer of the book, why is Luke giving such a detailed account of a, a ship voyage and a shipwreck? Well, the obvious answer is because He's divinely inspired, right? But I think the Lord wanted him to write in detail about it because he wants this to give us direction in our spiritual lives and offer us encouragement. When we face, he faced shipwreck, when we face whatever difficulty we face in our lives as believers, doing the will of God. He faced difficulty. To, you think, wow, I'm, I'm doing what God wants me to do. Why am I having all these problems? Why do I have these difficulties? Well, you know, God has his reasons for it, some of which are, are here in this text. But often, also, doesn't Satan hinder? Uh, God allows that, again, for his purposes. Well, whether others or you bring on these difficulties yourself, um, whether they are difficulties that are expected or not, you're bound to face difficulties. Maybe you're in the midst of them. Shut that door right there, please, because it, that, that's unheated, and this is already cold enough in here. You guys cold today? Yes. Keep your coats on. It's gonna and uh, cheer up because, as I said, it's gonna be in the 40s and 50s by the end of the week, so uh, we won't be freezing again. That's good. But Acts 27, what I want us to take away from this chapter today, Acts 27, we can learn how believers can spiritually navigate through the difficulties of our lives by faith, by depending upon God, which is exactly what Paul does as he really takes over the ship in this 27th chapter. We don't have time to read all the verses, but uh, we, we have a map of this, uh, this journey uh, that we want to put up. Uh, if you can look at the screen nearest you, uh, you, noticed, you notice how he, uh, he follows this course. They take off from here. They go to here. Um, you're going to see uh, Paul says, you know what? I don't think that... Uh, that we should go any further than here, but they don't listen to him. The captain and uh, the centurion, the pilot, they take the ship down here, and they want to go here to Phoenix and stay there during the winter months because in that part of the world, and especially in those days, uh, shipping would almost come to a screeching halt by mid-September. And then it wouldn't start again until February because of the, the terrible weather. So they're going to try to get to here, but instead a hurricane, a typhoon actually, when they start to move, it blows them way off course out to sea. And uh, the ship breaks up right here and they end up swimming to shore in the harbor of the Isle of what is today Malta. All right. So this is the course of uh, Acts 27. This is the course that they take. That's how uh, they ended up on that island. I want to take a, a, a moment, have a word of prayer, talk about uh, sailing with the Lord, uh, storms with the Lord, and then shipwreck with the Lord. So sailing, storms, and shipwreck, it's all here, and it's exciting, and it'll be helpful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you again for the opportunity to gather together. And thank you for this, for including this, uh, this occurrence, this uh, fact in the scripture 
And I pray that you'll use it in our lives in a very practical way. Now, Lord, teach us today what you want us to know so that we can navigate life, so that we can navigate through the storms or whatever comes our way. And we can do it with Jesus at our side. We thank you for that and pray that he'd be glorified through it. For we ask it in his name. Amen. So let's talk about sailing. It's actually the first 12 verses. I call that the sailing part. Um, <laughs> they're sailing. Paul is sailing with total on board 276 people. He's one of 276. The big load. They have cargo. They have grain. Uh, eventually on the ship that they, they get there uh, in, in Crete. And uh, <clears throat> they sail, but they don't sail alone. These guys don't know what they're getting into. In fact, Paul really doesn't know what he's getting into un until it happens. But he's not caught off guard. And I want to say this. It's like sailing with Paul, okay? Let's talk about sailing with Paul. And let's think about going forward with Paul, sailing with Paul, who was a spiritual leader. Let's talk about living our lives with spiritual uh, leadership. All of us need spiritual leadership in our lives. Even those of us that are pastors, we need spiritual leadership in our lives. And uh, sometimes we reach out to one another or we reach out to other spiritual leaders to get their help and their advice in our lives as well. And uh, so sailing with Paul is, to me, an idiom for doing life, navigating life, acknowledging the spiritual leadership that we need in our life. In fact, in the third verse, it says, the next day they touched at Sidon, okay? So they left here from Caesarea, actually. And the next day they landed in Sidon. And there in, in Sidon, Julius, who is the centurion in charge of the prisoners, is a prisoner ship. It, it says he gave Paul liberty, freedom, to go to his friends there in Sidon and refresh himself. He permitted him to have fellowship. And that's so, it, that's so important and wonderful, isn't it? As we're sailing, as we're navigating through life, we need spiritual leadership, but we need to have fellowship with one another. You need me. I'm a spiritual leadership, but I need you. I need your fellowship. We need to mutually encourage and hold one another accountable as believers. So this is what this is about. And there are four times in this chapter that Paul gives very wise counsel. For instance, look at verse 10. He says, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with much hurt, with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and the ship, but also of our lives. He is giving what sounds to me to be a bit of a prophecy here. He says, I perceive, and actually that word perceive means, you know, going on past experience, Paul is not uh, a newbie when it comes to sailing on a ship. In fact, there is a record here in this chapter of shipwreck, but Paul had already suffered shipwreck three times before this one. He says in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, uh, which was before this incident. So he spent a day and a night in the deep, he says in that chat. So he knows what he's talking about from past experience, and um, they don't listen to him. <laughs> Verse 11, nevertheless, the centurion believed the master, that is the, the, the captain uh, or the, the owner of the ship, and the uh, pilot of the ship, more than the things which were spoken by Paul. Let me tell you something. You need to learn to value important 
and 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 call important value and see the importance of as I'm trying to say spiritual godly advice that you get it's all right we get frustrated we give counsel to people and then they go and do what they want to do that you know that that's okay but it's a waste of time really to to have people come to you only then to have them go and do really the opposite of what you told them they should do biblically. But it's all right. Uh, I'm not going to be frustrated by that because uh, you got to live with the consequences. But the fact of the matter is, you and I need to learn to value and see the importance of spiritual godly advice. We need to seek it out. We never need, we never should make our decisions like these men did. Notice how they made their decision, verse 12. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenus and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete, that island, and lieth toward the south, west, and northwest. Now, that they would move uh, to Phoenix here, and there they would have uh, safety and shelter because they'd be south of the island. What does that say? That says that these men that were disagreeing with uh, Paul's advice were simply making the decision based on mere favorable circumstances. Let me give you a warning right here. And here it is. Be careful about making choices or making decisions, especially important decisions, based merely on favorable circumstances or what you might call an open door. Well, you know, God opened the door. Or, you know, it just worked out so beautifully. That does not equal the will of God all the time. It pays to listen to God. And God can lead you through circumstances that aren't favorable, and that be his will, because those circumstances are tethered to the Bible, the Word of God, and prayer, and you have an inner convincement from the Holy Spirit that this is what he wants you to do, whether it's favorable or not. And you also have spiritual counsel from people who you know are in tune with God. So when it comes to sailing, make sure you do it with the proper spiritual leadership and with fellowship with the people of God. Then the second part that I see in this chapter is storms. There's a storm, and we have storms. The dangers and the difficulties uh, that at times uh, are associated with us because of other people's unbelief. These three men, the uh, centurion, the pilot, the owner of the ship, they disagreed with Paul, and they weren't saved men. And as a result of following their uh, decision, it put Paul and everyone else on board in jeopardy because of their unbelief, because they didn't believe the word that was coming from Paul. And it says, if you'll pick up with me, I guess in the 13th verse, and the south, when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had attained their purpose, they loosed then, uh, and they sailed close by Crete. Here they are. Uh, they're sailing close by Crete. And then what happens Verse 14, but not, not long after there rose against it a tempestuous wind. That word tempestuous, we get our English word typhoon from. A typhoon is like a hurricane at sea. Okay, there were a, a, a typhoon wind called Iraklodon. That is actually an interesting word. It's part Greek and part Latin. And... Uh, it's a word that uh, literally means a northeast, uh, a northeast wind. We call it 
a nor'easter here in uh, this part of the country. So they had a hurricane, a typhoon, a nor'easter, and uh, as a result, look what happens. Verse 15, and when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. They lost total control of being able to steer that ship. In fact, it was pretty hopeless. In verse 20, it says, when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay upon us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. It's a hopeless situation here in this storm. And uh, they lose total control of this uh, ship and have no hope. In fact, for two weeks, this goes on. We, we find out later in this passage. This storm has been raging for two weeks, and they're completely without hope. What do they do next? Well, it says in verse 17, uh, they, they took up the lifeboat because they may need that. <clears throat> and then they, under, they, they took to brace the undergirding of the ship. There were cables that were for that purpose that they stretched out underneath the ship and, and tightened on the top to hold the boards together so it, it would be able to take the battering of the winds and the waves that they were caught up in. And it says they um, feared that they would be driven onto the, the, um, the uh, sandbars between where they're at uh, here and the coast of North Africa. And so they let the anchor down so it would drag and it would, uh, it would slow them down. They put other things hanging off. They took the main mast down at, so the wind couldn't push them as easily. And it says in verse 20, uh, actually not that verse, but uh, I think uh, verse yeah, verse 18, the next day, they lightened the ship. They lightened the ship. And in fact, they lightened it and threw overboard much of the cargo that they didn't need to survive. That's called, in nautical terms, jettison. They jettisoned uh, the cargo. So it wouldn't uh, pull them down. And they were taking safety precautions to be able to keep the boat or the ship afloat. And so they threw stuff overboard. It reminded me of when they threw Jonah overboard. They jettisoned Jonah, remember? Now, Paul is not running from the will of God. Paul is in the center of the will of God. But he's in a, in a storm just as fierce as the storm that caught Jonah's ship when he was running from the Lord. So being in God's will, again, does not does not uh, protect you from the storms of life. Don't get that idea. That's a wrong idea. Jonah got thrown overboard. Here they're throwing cargo overboard. When they threw Jonah overboard, the storm stopped because he was the problem. They threw the cargo over, overboard, but the storm continues because God's not done teaching what he wants them to teach. But I would say this, in the storms that we face in our lives, the difficulties that we face, perhaps there are some things that we need to get rid of. Maybe there are some things that uh, really are a danger in our lives that we need to jettison. We need to throw them overboard. You know what they are? The Lord to uh, perhaps tell you in your heart what they are. Maybe it's some website that you visit. Uh, maybe it's movies uh, that you watch. You know you shouldn't or shows that, that you are watching that you shouldn't be watching. I've told you before, I was watching a show uh, one time and it, and it intrigued me because of the mystery that was, that was tied to it. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, if you, if you don't stop watching that, I can't use you. And I, and I, I dropped it. 
Uh, I don't want that. Even no matter how intriguing this is, I don't want I don't want that in my life to hinder. So maybe you need to jettison something in your life. Maybe there's a relationship that you need to get rid of or just or anything that hinders your progress. You're moving forward with the Lord. You need to throw it overboard. And what happens is, verse 21, after a long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of the whole crew. And he said, sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not loosed from Crete. And you wouldn't have gained this harm and this loss. <laughs> so that brings me to the shipwreck. It's about to happen. It hasn't quite happened yet. But I want you to see how Paul firmly acts and strongly influences everyone. On, In fact, you know what's happening at this point? What happens? Beginning at verse 21, Paul takes over the ship. This is amazing. He takes over the He's a prisoner. There's a centurion over him and the other prisoners. There's a pilot that is driving this ship. And he takes over. And the first thing he does, the prisoner who becomes the captain, you might say, he gives four areas of encouragement. But the first area, I don't know if you could call it encouragement, is that 21st verse where he gives gentle rebuke. You know, there's times where we need to be rebuked. These guys aren't saved men, at least at this time. But he's addressing his comments to the centurion, the pilot, and the captain for ignoring what he knew was God-given warning. And uh, they didn't listen to him. Again, we need to learn to listen to spiritual godly advice. Once in a while, people will come to me and they will say, you know, what do you think about this? Uh, what should I do in this situation? And as God gives wisdom, if I have the wisdom right then, I share it with him. If I don't know, I say, well, let me prayerfully think about that, and I'll get back with you. Look for spiritual godly advice. Don't turn a deaf ear like these men did, because it brought about a shipwreck. He gives a gentle rebuke here to these men, but then... I love what happens in, uh, after that. He shares the word of God with him. He shares the word. Look, verse 22. Now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. Boy, that's great news, right? When you've been in the midst of a, a typhoon like this for days on end, and now here's the guy that said you shouldn't have done it, you should have listened to me, and now I'm telling you something very encouraging. I'm sharing the word with you. There stood by me, verse 23, this very night, the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. By the way, I don't know that this is is 100% foolproof, but I've kind of convinced myself that when it comes to angelic ministry in the life of believers, they're ministering spirits, right? They minister to believers. It's always in the realm of the physical, uh, they minister to physical needs, uh, to physical needs of the moment. Here it is. This angel came, appeared to Paul, and gave him encouragement uh, about the storm that they have been in so long. And he says, fear not, verse 24, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. So that's why he stands up and says boldly, men, Listen to me. You shouldn't have left like I told you, but I want to tell you that God, you should be of good cheer because God's convinced me. God spoke to me through an angel, obviously. He didn't, he didn't tell him that uh, at that point. God sp spoke to me through an angel, and you're all going to be safe. Well, wow. he says in verse 25, therefore, be of good cheer. <laughs> Because I believe God, so should you, I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Albeit, 
we must be cast upon a certain island. We're going to be shipwrecked, but we're not going to lose life here. Verse 22, when Paul stands up and shares that vision that he had that night with this crew, with these uh, uh, shipmates, this is the turning point in the whole account. A God-given vision, God-given direction, a word directly from the Lord that that is encouragement from the Lord. You know, at times, sometimes difficult times, sometimes not difficult, God gives special messages to his people to strengthen them with real encouragement so that it might be a blessing to you or to others that are with you. Now, he doesn't necessarily do it through an angelic visitation or an angelic vision. He could if he wanted to, but uh, God at times speaks in special ways when difficulties uh, particularly are upon us. He shares words of encouragement with us, usually from the scripture, usually from our time spent in the word. This is why it's so important you are regularly in God's word. You're going to face difficulties all the time. God's word is the way that he speaks to you. And he gives you messages of encouragement. And he means those not only to encourage you, but for you to share with other people uh, that uh, may be facing difficulties or may in the future, but they'll have a word from the Lord that he gave you. And they can get their own as well. So this is an encouraging thing. After the gentle rebuke, He shares the word with this whole crew. And then he gives them warning, verse 27. When the 14th night was come, as they were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. And they sounded and they found that the depth was 20 fathoms. I think that's 120 feet deep. And they had gone a little farther, they sounded again, they found it 15 fathoms, it was uh, 90 feet deep. And then fearing that they would be cast upon rocks, they cast the four anchors out, again, to slow down the ship, and they wished for the day. And the shipmen were about to jump out of the ship, to to jump overboard, but when they had let down the the lifeboat into the sea under uh, color as though they would have cast anchors they were they were sneaking out and paul said to the centurion verse 31 except these soldiers abide in the ship you won't be saved so then the soldiers cut the ropes off of the lifeboat and let her fall and and float away so what is he doing here he shared the word now he is giving warning because these soldiers were acting in in selfish unbelief when they were trying to sneak and save their own skin and who cares about anyone else. They were also rebelling against the word of God that was promised to them by Paul's uh, encouragement in verse 24. Look, God's promised me all of you are going to be safe. So they're acting in selfish unbelief and in rebellion to the promises of God's word. And when they were doing so, Paul caught them and he said, you are putting the whole ship in danger. If you continue with this, other lives will be in danger as well. Let me make a point here for us. And that is this. When you and I choose to ignore or act contrary to what God says in his word, you may not only bring danger and destruction to yourself, you might bring it to your whole crew, whoever that might be. You're not an island. You impact and influence others. So be careful. Like these men, they're acting in selfish unbelief. They're really in rebellion to the promise of God through the mouth of Paul. They're ignoring all of that. They're acting contrary to what God said through Paul. And as a result, there are warned, you're going to bring destruction to everyone and not just yourselves. Unless these men stay aboard, you can't be saved. Paul says you're not going to be rescued. Well, there's a third 
area in which Paul is used and, and, and is a means of encouragement. In verse 33, pick it up there with me. While the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take food. This is the 14th day that you've tarried and you've continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some food. This is for your health. There shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. Wow, that's pretty good. Not only will your lives be saved. Verse 35, and when he had thus spoken, he, Paul, took bread, gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. And then they all were of good cheer and they all took some food. What's this? Here's the third thing Paul did. He set a wonderful example here. He took food and he openly thanked God for it. He openly thanked the Lord for his food. Hey, do you do that when you go out to eat? Do you openly thank God for your food before you eat when everyone else in the restaurant might be looking at you? Paul used this as a good example. He set an example for these men. And what he evidences when he does this, when he takes the food, thanks God for it, and then eats it himself, he is explicitly showing his trust in God. He's caring for the temple, for the body. And uh, at the same time, he is preparing for the demands that will be faced in the morning when light comes. You know, at times, one spiritually minded believer can change the whole situation by giving visible evidence that they are depending upon God, that they believe the word of God, and they are doing what God, they're calmly resting in what the Lord has said. Set an example. And then finally, in verses 39 to 44, what happens is um, we get the number of how many were on board in verse 37, 276. When they had eaten enough, then they threw the rest of the food in the in the sea, lighting the ship again. Verse 39, when it was day, they, they, they didn't know where they were, but they discovered that there was land and a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded that they could possibly put the ship in there. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves to the sea. They loosed the rudder bands verse 40, and as, as they were making toward the shore in that harbor, falling into a place where the seas met, they ran the ship aground on a sandbar, and the fore part of the ship stuck fast. The back of it was beaten to pieces by the waves, and the soldiers said in verse 42, okay, we got to kill the prisoners, because in, according to Rome, if you lost prisoners, if you had prisoners that escaped, you would die. So they say, let's kill the prisoners uh, rather than face a death penalty ourselves. And uh, notice what happens. The centurion, he says, no, he kept them from doing that. And he just said, look, whoever can swim, jump and swim to land. And so it says, verse 44, the rest, some on boards. Some on broken pieces of the ship, they escaped all safe to land, just as God had told Paul would happen. You know, dangerous, difficult situations in our lives are really opportunities for God to reveal himself through us. That's what Paul actually does here. An opportunity for God to reveal himself Jesus is seen. His power is evidenced. It's a time for him to share with these men who God is. I don't know. But if I was one of them, I think I'd want to be saved after experiencing this and seeing God at work in, in this man's life. I don't know if they were saved spiritually. They were all saved physically. But uh, maybe there, many of them were saved spiritually as well as well because I'm sure this gave an opportunity for the gospel that Paul had shared and would continue to share to really have weight in their lives. They see it, and they experience God's hand upon them. The worst difficulty in life 
can't stop the purposes of God. God is able to overrule all our circumstances, and uh, he often does in our diff You should see the difficulties in your life as a believer. You should see those as divine appointments to open doors of ministry for you that you wouldn't otherwise have. Um, to give you an opportunity to witness to someone about the Lord Jesus Christ. Spirit-filled believers, really. When you look at Paul here on board that sinking ship, spirit-filled believers are the most important, most valuable person in any situation to be around. You know, I believe this city is still standing because of Christians that are spirit-filled and are praying for this city, that God would intervene in. Same goes for our country. If it wouldn't be for godly people that are praying and that are living lives, spirit-filled lives, I think it'd be done for already. And that's what I want you to really take away from this passage here with Paul, that because God's hand is upon spirit-filled believers. They're in touch with God, and uh, they know how to fellowship with God. They know how to connect with the Lord. They know how to hear God's voice, and they move forward in trust, dependence upon God. They can move through whatever difficulty waters safely. Remember Noah? How God preserved him in a, in a tremendous storm in a boat. We are like Noah's in Christ, we can move through the most difficult situations. I thought about it in this way to close this out. God put eternity in the human heart. Every human heart has eternity in it. And that is fomenting. And it is, as a result, it, it, it foments a constant search for noble meaning and purpose in human life and in life circumstances. Because God's put eternity in the human heart, the, the, it, it foments uh, a desire for a noble meaning and purpose for life and for all of life's circumstances as well. Well, the Bible provides the answer, and uh, the believer uh, really is, uh, is privy and privileged to experience God's answer. Even Christians sometimes, however, are confused when in the course of their desire to live for the Lord or to serve the Lord, they face difficult setbacks and trials. And they're tempted to ask the question, why? I spoke with a, a believer recently who was asking that question, well, why? Why would God allow this? You know, all I want to do is just, you know, be faithful to the Lord. Why would God allow this? I think it was necessary for me to reframe uh, the question in his mind from why to what. And what I mean by that is not why would God allow this, but what does God want me to learn from this? What does God want to teach me through this? That's the whole idea here because we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, he predesigned, he predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son, to be like Jesus. And so all that he allows into our lives are for that purpose and that noble end to make us like Christ. And that's where life becomes most meaningful and most purposeful. And so instead of asking, why did God allow this? Ask, Lord, what do you want me to learn from this? Because his purpose, his ultimate goal for believers is that he might have a glorious church that his bride might be without spot or wrinkle, a glorious church, that he might sanctify us, that he might make us holy, separate us unto himself completely, that we might, like him, be like him. That's his purpose, that he might wash us and cleanse us and, 
and sanctify our lives to be a glorious church. So not why, but what? And I hope you saw from Acts 27 the answer. Why a shipwreck? Why a difficulty? Oh, a lot of reasons. Gives you an opportunity to share God's word. Gives you an opportunity to hear from the Lord personally. Gives you an opportunity to give other people warning and to set an example of what it means to really trust and rest in the Lord when you're in the face of a storm and how you then can be used to rescue others.